Hi, my name is Leanne Timrick, and I was asked to share with you my experience in writing a biography for Evergreen Cemetery. So today I'd like to talk a little bit about my approach and the process for writing a biography, as well as some of the organizational and research tips that I found particularly helpful. Like many of you, I had never written a biography, so it was definitely a bit of a learning experience. But for me, before I could start writing, I really needed to understand a couple things. First, who was this biography for? And secondly, what was it really supposed to accomplish? While the reader of these biographies could include descendants, family, um, members of the public, historical researchers, and so on, ultimately, I believe the biography is for the individual. I'd like to think that if Shirley Carter Williams, the individual whose biography I recently completed, was to read the biography, he would see himself and feel that his life had been, had been justly uh, represented. As such then, the biography needs to be more than just a list of figures and facts and dates. It's really a story that celebrates a life and as such requires we, we expand our thinking and our creativity a bit beyond the basics. So with that in mind, on a blank sheet of paper in front of me, I'm ready to write. And the first thing to look for is what information you've been provided. All you may have is a headstone, but that can provide a, a lot of really great information. So let's look at the headstone of Shirley Carter Williams in some detail. So this is the gravestone for Shirley Carter Williams. In addition to his name, there's the date of his death, and there's no birth date. But there is some additional inscription written on the headstone that proved to be very helpful. It says, quote, first worshipful master of the Loverture Lodge 156, AF and AM. AF and AM stands for Ancient Free and Accepted Masons. So from this I know that he was a member of the Freemasons and in fact held a senior leadership position. So this gives me an area of research to pursue around his involvement with the Freemasons. Now the headstone may be all you start with, but I was fortunate because I also was provided the death certificate for Shirley Carter Williams. Here's what the death certificate looks like. Now, if you weren't given the death certificate, this is probably the first document you ought to locate because it provides so much information. The best place to find the death certificate is to do a search on either familysearch.org or ancestry.com. Familysearch.org is free. You just have to create a login and access to Ancestry is provided to us by Enrichment. You can also search for the death certificate through the Library of Virginia's death records. And as you search, remember to try different variations of spelling of the name because the names are frequently entered differently into the system. If you do get a hit, pull up the original document, such as the one you see here, and you'll have a lot more information than just the summary. So looking more closely at Shirley Williams' death certificate, we see he was a male, African-American, married, his wife's name, Louisa Williams, his age, uh, his occupation, his birthplace is listed as Richmond, but the exact location and date is unknown. And this is not unusual for someone born in the 18, late 1860s, 1870s. Also see where he died. He died in this case at the home of his son, Stanley Williams, and this was another important piece of information uh, in looking at the family members. Shows where he was buried, of course, and um, cause of death. With this basic information, I could now put together a research plan to answer the following research questions. First, who were the members of his family? We just saw the name of his wife and his son, but who were his parents, other children, etc.? 
What did he do? His jobs, his social affiliations, his church, for example, the Freemasons. Where did he live? Not just the address, but the community. In the case of Shirley Williams, he spent almost his entire life within the Jackson Ward area of Richmond. And that was an important detail that provided some really great information about, about where he lived and the community he, he lived in. When did he live historically? In other words, what was going on in the community and the world around him? Shirley Williams had three sons, two of which fought in World War I. Important piece of data and also uh, gave you some insight into what his family was doing. How did he live? Was he wealthy or poor, a family man, a business leader, aspects of his character? And finally, why is his life important and worth remembering? It may be simply that he was a good person or a great father, but what might he want to be remembered for? And with that, we can now look more closely at the resources available to us to get the answers to these questions. Armed with some basic biographical information and your research questions, you can now start collecting data. So where is the data? A good starting point is a list of resources shown here, which includes information about the resource and how to access. As I mentioned previously, I recommend starting online with either Ancestry or Family Search, as they will conduct a pretty broad sweep across a number of vital statistic type databases and that will help get you started. During the search of the genealogical sites, some of the documents you may come across include death records, marriage certificates, census entries, and the like. Some might be for the individual you are researching. Others may be for possible family members. You may even struggle to find information depending upon the time period you are searching. As you sort through the different entries, Trying to determine what's relevant for your biography, you may find yourself going down some blind alleys. I know I did. My early notes are covered with scribbles and crossouts and stickies where I had found conflicting or better data and had to go back and scribble out what was no longer accurate. The nature of this research is just that it's, it's not linear. So to help with the data collection process, I'd like to share with you a couple of simple tools that I found very helpful. The first is just a simple Excel spreadsheet. Down the left, I've listed each year of the individual's life. And across the top, I listed columns for address, occupation, source of information, and just some room for notes. This really helps keep track of the source of your information in case you need to cite it in your biography. I also highlighted key dates that I knew would be used in the biography. Then throughout the collection process, as I got new information, I could quickly update it. The second tool I found useful was creating a family tree. Now I didn't create the formal structure you see here until I was completed with the research. I just created one on a piece of paper and populated the names of family members, key dates such as birth, death, marriage dates, military service, etc. And I just kept correcting it as I got better information. I kept these two documents with me at all times, particularly when I did research at the Library of Virginia. So I had key na names, dates, and locations handy. To start, go to the Library of Virginia's homepage, click on the button that reads Using the Collections, and you'll bring up a page that looks like this. Under Guides and Indexes, you see a list of topics. And if you click on any of these topics, it brings up a list of related resources that you can search for biographical information. For example, if you open up African American and Native American resources, you will see resources such as African American church histories or African American newspapers. African American Research at the Library of Virginia to 1870, cohabitation registers. Just remember that the majority of these resources are only available on microfiche. Immediately below the Guides and Indexes section, 
there's a section called databases and ebooks, much of which is shown here. These are external databases and ebooks made available to you from the library, and many of these are online. Again, there's a list of topics that can be expanded to see a more detailed list of resources. Under biographical and genealogical, for example, you will find links to detailed historical records on slavery as told through the personal papers of former slave owners. This is also where you would find Ancestry.com, which you can access as a member of the Library of Virginia. Additionally, from the Library of Virginia homepage, there's a tab entitled Virginia Memories. And this section highlights some of their newest or most popular collections. The three shown here are particularly useful in doing African-American genealogical research. For example, Virginia Chronicle has early copies of African-American newspapers from all across Virginia and is online and fully text searchable. Virginia Untold provides access to pre-1865 African-American historical documents. Having taken a broad look at the resources of the Library of Virginia, let's revisit the research questions and look at specific examples of resources that will help answer them. This chart simply maps the kind of information you're looking for to some of the types of documents that can provide it. Starting with the who question, you see that documents such as the federal census, newspaper articles, personal property records, obituaries, etc., are good places to find the answers. And to answer the what, you could also look at the city directories. Let's look more closely at the census document. If you look at the highlighted area of the this 1880 census, you see it provides the address for Susan Williams, a black female, age 34. It also states that she's a widow, works as a washerwoman, and has two sons. Another great source are the city directories available through the Library of Virginia. Most Virginia cities and towns published city directories which list not only the name and address, but also whether the individual owned or rented their house, their occupation and race, sometimes their fraternal or civic organizations. And since they were published yearly, you can track changes over time. To answer the where question and understand the community or the neighborhood that the individual lived in, you can look at geographical and historical records. For example, a great source for community context are local historical societies, such as the Historic Jackson Ward Association. They have archival information on the area, such as the business environment, entertainment and restaurants, neighborhoods, architecture, churches, and the like. This is helpful to understand what life was like during the period of time when the individual lived there. Additionally, the Library of Virginia has an online mapping resource that can give you a historical view of a neighborhood. So for example, this 1905 map shows the intersection of West Lee and North Lombardi Street in Richmond. Note the incredible amount of detail provided on the homes, schools, buildings, architecture, and industries in the area. To research when the individual lived or the historical context, certainly the historical societies are a good source of information, along with other historical documents on national and African-American issues of the time period. Black newspapers, which can be accessed through the Library of Virginia, are a time capsule of what was going on throughout the history in the lives of African Americans. Not only did they publish national news, the newspapers published local information on social, church, fraternal, legal, and business events. So a good source 
of community life as well. And depending upon the time period you are researching, war records will be an important area to search. As mentioned earlier, the library has a special collection on this. And this is an example of a registration card for an enlistment in World War I. Not only does it provide en enlistment data, it also provides some information on address and occupation that might not have been found anywhere else. As you work through your research, you're likely to begin to form a sense of how this person lived. The death of loved ones, the ownership of property, participation in the church or military uh, veteran. These data points will all paint a picture of a person's life. But you may also uncover some little nugget that requires additional digging to really understand what it means. For example, the individual whose biography I recently completed was a Prince Hall Freemason, a fraternal organization that I knew little about. After doing some internet search, I discovered the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Virginia and was able to call and get some additional information on the roles and responsibilities of someone designated as a, quote, worshipful master of the Masons. This information helped me enhance the personal characteristics of this individual. In conclusion, as you write your biography, remember, just as no two individuals are alike, no two bio biographies are alike, you may have uncovered a treasure trove of information or struggled to find just a few pieces of data. Your search may have to expand beyond traditional genealogical resources. Work with what you have, but as I mentioned in the beginning, the purpose of the biography is to honor and celebrate someone's life. So to do so might require you to think more broadly about integrating context into your biography. Thank you for your time and attention. I hope that these tips and research suggestions are useful to you as you take on this important responsibility. By preserving the life stories of those interred at Evergreen Cemetery, you ensure that their voices will be heard by future generations. Thank you again.